for all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our scripture this morning is John chapter 8, the first 11 verses. John 8, verses 1 through 11. And our subject is the woman taken in adultery. John 8 verses 1 through 11. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This passage has been the focus of a great deal of, of discussion and some controversy throughout the church. In particular, it has been used to say that Jesus amended the biblical law here regarding adultery, that they say he repudiated the civil law against it and its penalty, death. And this has great implications if that's true. And Jesus does here... Tell the woman, neither do I condemn thee. 
Uh, the question is what he meant by um, that statement. He, some will emphasize the condemn. I don't condemn thee. I, I'm not go, that you're not condemned for what you did. And you, you could go into an extreme of antinomianism if Jesus, if the emphasis there is on the condemnation. But I believe there the I is as opposed to her accusers, neither do I accuse thee, because her accusers had just left, and he did, neither do I accuse thee. The debate on this passage is very old, and it dates back to the uh, early church. Uh, in fact, it's not, this text is not found in some very, very ancient uh, manuscripts. And so in the 19th century, the English Standard Version and the American Revised <coughs> Translations both put this in brackets because they wanted to designate that, that it was questionable whether this was over in the original. Interestingly enough, though, St. Augustine had uh, addressed this issue of this text in the early 5th century, about 20 years before or 30 years before uh, the Council of Chalcedon, he had said that this text was intentionally left out of some early copies of John because some people felt it so minimalized the offense of adultery or could be so misused that they intentionally omitted it. So Augustine was saying it was original, but it was intentionally left out by some people because they thought that... Uh, they were, this was, Jesus was being way too light on this woman and it minimalized the offense of adultery and they thought that this could be misused uh, for this reason. Well, so the controversy goes way back. Few antinomians say this passage actually repeals the seventh commandment. They, still say, they say adultery is still a sin. But they say that the penalty is no longer death, for one thing, and they also said that adultery should be forgiven on repentance because Jesus said, I don't condemn thee. Antinomian forgiveness, however, has a problem because it's always on man's terms and not God's terms. And in, you all recall when you were little and you had a spat with a playmate or a sibling and you were told, say you're sorry. And you weren't in the least bit sorry, uh, but you said it. Um, you know, on man's terms, forgiveness can, the word forgiveness can mean little or nothing. In the last few weeks, very powerful men have been outed for their sexual immorality, and many have lost their, their jobs. In each case, the offense is said to be against women. And women have been victimized by these men. But nobody mentions any offense against God. It's always an offense against man. And sin does involve, very often, sin against man as well as God. Obviously, theft is a sin against man and a sin against God. But we completely leave out the offense against God. The standards of men are very changeable. <clears throat> and... When we change the standards, sometimes we change it for the better or for the worse. What these men did with impunity is now rightfully condemned, but not for the entirely the right reasons. The sin is their offense against others. Nobody mentions their sexual immorality as, as an offense against God. In fact, if you notice the response of a lot of these men to these revelations, which are sometimes so notorious they don't even deny them. They'll say, I'm sorry if I have offended anyone. In some cases, they were accused of rape. But I'm sorry if I've offended anyone. Or I'm sorry I've let people down. It's entirely man-centered. On the contrary, when, uh, uh, when David was exposed as an adulterer, he said to God, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Sin is ultimately against God. The Old Testament penalty for 
adultery was death. That's clear, and that's why they brought this woman to her. The question is whether Jesus was even talking about the death penalty here. If the interpretation of antinomians is correct, then we would have to say that the scribes and Pharisees won this exchange. That's the, the, the antinomian version of this has the accusers of Jesus actually getting everything they wanted. They succeeded in their goal. John states the goal in verse 6. He says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. What would they accuse him of? If Jesus had changed the law about adultery in any way, they had the accusation they wanted that Jesus was a lawbreaker. But they didn't get that accusation. See, they left defeated. They didn't come back the next day and says, guess what, Jesus says that the law against adultery has changed. You can't trust a man like that. They dropped the whole issue. They didn't have anything to accuse Jesus of. They did not leave victorious. They left defeated. So we should first establish a little bit of context. This is soon after the Feast of Tabernacles, perhaps the next day. The chief priests and the Pharisees had, at that feast, attempted to arrest Jesus, but failed. There were two outstanding charges against Jesus that had resurfaced since his arrival back in Jerusalem. These charges date back to his um, earlier, much earlier, um, visit to Jerusalem early in his ministry when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. They said he was a lawbreaker and he was a blasphemer. Those are now old charges that they want to bring back. He was accused of being a lawbreaker because he healed the man on the Sabbath and he told the man to pick up his bed and walk on the Sabbath. A very pharisaical interpretation of, of not working on the Sabbath. Then they said when he said that he made his God his uh, his father, and he referred to him as my God as my father, they said, well, that's blasphemy because you've made himself, yourself equal to God. So lawbreaking and blasphemy were standing charges. They were also now calling him uh, demonic. They've already brought that up again. We saw back in Galilee they had started that. Uh, that was a difficult charge to prove. And that was really used for effect to, to persuade the people not to listen to, to Jesus. But the easy one to try to prove is to get Jesus to say something that was anti-law. So in this temptation, the focus was on getting Jesus to, to, be, to express an opinion that would be against the law. They wanted to trap Jesus on a very sensitive issue. And they were trying to be shrewd and get him into a corner where, no matter how he answers, he's going to look bad. We're told in Mark 8, 38, that adultery was common at the time. And they thought they had an issue in which any response would cost Jesus popularity. If Jesus took a populist approach and minimalized adultery, or in any way said it was a lesser offense, they could accuse him of being of lawbreakers. The accuser could say, we're the champions of the law, not Jesus. We're the, the, the guarding the religious heritage that we've inherited from our forefathers. They could claim the moral high ground if Jesus in any way lessened the Mosaic law regarding adultery. However, if Jesus upheld the law fully it would be a very unpopular view. So if they couldn't accuse him of being a lawbreaker, they could embarrass him, which is what they, either one would accomplish their purpose. Now something else about the context we have to make very clear. This was not a legal case. This was, and this was not a trial. Adultery was not a capital offense in the Roman Empire. And the Sanhedrin did not have the power to execute anyone. This woman was not going to be executed. If they all agreed on her punishment, she was not going to be executed. 
This was a religious and theological question about the Mosaic Law. So this was not a civil prosecution in any way. Note in verse 2, Jesus was sitting and teaching. While he was teaching, they brought this woman to him and they asked him a question as a religious teacher, and they addressed him as master. Master means teacher. It's like addressing someone as doctor or professor. He says, you're learned on the a law, uh, and people sitting at your feet, so professor. It doesn't imply we agree with you, professor, just like if we referred to someone as a professor who was an evolutionist, this evolutionary scientist, we wouldn't necessarily say, I agree with your opinions. It's just that we were showing him a little respect for his, his academic credentials. The presence of the woman in this religious uh, debate was for dramatic purposes only. She was being cruelly used as a prop. They were saying, in effect, here's an actual case of adultery. Are you going to advocate the death penalty for adultery? Those who are against the enemy still do that. They still say, oh, do you think we should have a death penalty for this? I said, well, that's, you can say that's what God's law says. It's not going to happen any too soon. And it would not be an easy thing to institute. If you did it, if you impose that penalty on a godless society, it, it would be rather hypocritical. You have to start with faith. You have to convert people first. You have to change the culture first before you begin with the penalties. You don't begin with the penalties of God's law and try to change a society that way. You have to start with regeneration. But they like to bring up the worst case scenario that will make you look the most extreme. Now, if you look at verse 49 in chapter, in the previous chapter, in chapter 7, note what the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin had said in frustration uh, at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles. They said, This people who know knoweth not the law are cursed. See, the religious leaders were determined that the issue of the law was their strength. So they brought this woman to Jesus with an irrefutable fact. Adultery carried the death penalty in the law. If Jesus denied that or advocated another standard they had exactly what they wanted to criticize Jesus and present themselves as the defenders of the faith of Abraham and the law of Moses. Back in Galilee, Jesus, remember, had accused the scribes and Pharisees of ignoring the law and substituting their own traditions for it. And that was in Matthew 15. These accusers wanted to prove Jesus was really not a literalist when it came to obeying the law, he was just like them. He was willing to, to, to change it a, a little bit. And especially if they gave him a really unpopular case, that of the death penalty for adultery, he wouldn't uphold the law of Moses. Again, that's all theoretical because nobody was executed in the first century by the Romans for adultery. Jesus had also said in the Sermon on the Mount that he had not come to abolish the law, and that's what Paul understood in Romans 3.31 when he said our faith establishes the law. Jesus claimed to be a greater champion of the law than the accusers. So they set him up in the hopes that they could prove that he was not the champion of the law that he pretended to be. They wanted to be able to say Jesus tweaks the application of the law just like we do. It's perfectly legitimate, but we're the experts on the law. So John is here recounting what they tried to do and that they failed. If Jesus really did what antinomians suggest he did, then they got just what they wanted. They didn't fail. They got Jesus to renounce the law. The antinomian view has Jesus handing his crit critics a charge which they then didn't use against him. And you can... These men would have used that charge against him immediately if they felt that they were victorious. 
The woman had been taken in the act of adultery. She didn't deny it. Jesus didn't deny it because he told her to sin no more. So that was not, her guilt was not even in question. It's entirely possible she was set up. And it's also possible that the man she was involved with in this adulterous act was one of these accusers or one of their group. The man is conspicuously absent. If the woman was taken in the act, so was the man, yet he is not mentioned or present. They, they were bringing this woman for emotional effect. Even today, women are treated less harshly for sexual offenses than men are. When you hear about teachers who have uh, uh, immoral relationships with their students, the men are punished far more harshly than the women, typically. In fact, in, in one or two cases, the women have gotten off with probation. So Jesus is presented with an instance of adultery. Not a trial. This was a, in a sort of like in a classroom situation while Jesus was teaching. The scribes and Pharisees pointed at this woman and said, Biblical law says she should be executed. Would you agree? Well, what John describes next has always caused a, a lot of speculation. With great drama, they had demanded that Jesus answer a question. They felt they had him cornered. They felt they had outsmarted him. And so they were anxious for his response because they knew he couldn't have a good response to this. Verse 6 says, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. And people like to speculate about what he wrote on the ground. Yeah. I think it's largely pointless. Uh, because that's why we're not told. I think what is essential is that there was a long pause. They thought they had him, so Jesus let them think that. He had no response, but he was ignoring them. He says, Jesus, Jesus had, had been seated teaching, and they brought this woman in, certainly against her will, and demanded Jesus answer their question. They were totally convinced they had him in a corner. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. The translation from the Greek, according to J. Green's interlinear Bible, is, but Jesus, down stooping with the finger, wrote in the earth, not appearing, to hear is implied. So, Jesus began by ignoring the question. Uh, the question that was actually put to him, he just, he didn't answer. But they repeated their question. And he addressed the issue by noting something else in Mosaic law. He responded by saying, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Now, false witness was a serious offense, and the, the witness against the accused had to take part in the execution. I mean, that was a heavy responsibility, not only to testify against someone, but to take part in the execution. And normally the complainant and the primary witness would be the spouse. The primary accuser would normally be the spouse. But false witness not only had a responsibility to take part in the execution, but he also had a penalty attached if he was a false witness. A false witness was liable for the same punishment as the crime. So if it was a capital case the, and the false witness was found to be a false witness, he was subject to a cap, capital punishment. So being a false witness was a very serious offense in biblical law. Jesus Christ was riding on the ground, and then he just said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Then he went back to riding on the ground, ignoring him. That's his only response to the scribes and Pharisees. What did he mean? If you take the antinomian approach, this is a new attitude to God's law. We're all sinners, so we should just forgive one another's. Nobody has the right to make an accusation against 
another because he's a sinner. You have to be consistent, you see. You can't say it only applies to adultery but not to other things. You can't just apply this to adultery. If, if this is a new principle that extends to all sin and it forbids all judging because it applies to a greater offense like a capital offense then obviously it applies to lesser offenses such as theft. And some antinomians have taken it that far. Not, not the typical antinomian you meet today in a church. Some say all laws now invalid except for the leading of the spirit. In other words, it's subjective and personal. We decide what law fits in with our culture and our times and the leading of the spirit. It's all very vague. Again, it gets, goes back to man's standard. Ultimately, antinomianism relies upon man's standard as to what's a good moral law. What's Christian? Christian is a good term, but sometimes we use that term Christian to say something that isn't necessarily biblical. But it feels, fits into with what we think should be, and therefore we define that as Christian. We have to be careful that there's Christ and his word in what we call Christian. And what did Jesus mean by without sin? I think he was referring specifically to adultery to these men. If it's a general meaning of sin, then that would mean that no judgment was possible. And he was telling these men, you can't judge anything. You can't call anybody a sinner. If you're a sinner, well, everybody's a sinner, therefore no judging would be possible. See, they, they, that would prove too much. And that's the problem with the antinomian position on this. It proves too much. Because if Jesus had said that, they had more than they would have possibly hoped for from Jesus. He was totally anti-law. He was totally anarchistic, if that's what he meant. Jesus had simply said, if you stand as this woman's official accuser, you have to have clean hands. Because if you're a false witness, a hypocritical witness, you're liable for the same punishment. They knew the law. You can't demand her death for that for which you're guilty. And we're told that one by one they left, convicted by their conscience. Each one individually turned and left. This was in the temple, a large complex. There were always other people there. So it would have been easy for a group of men that approached Jesus with this woman to just, you know, one by one, they just kind of stepped back and merged in with the other traffic in the temple. And as the seniors walked away, the younger men looked around and found that their ranks were dwindling. And so they just said, they just walked away. They realized their group was dissipating and, and they all then left. Jesus addressed the guilt of the accusers their sin, their hypocrisy. He didn't address their question. He said, you want to talk about the law? Let's talk about something else about the law, about the necessity of the witness having clean hands and the penalty for false witness. And so they, they just backed off. And I think he was specifically talking about the guilt of adultery amongst these men. Jesus was left alone, in other words, with his without his accusers. Presumably some of the people to whom he was teaching were still present. And this woman was there. Know what Jesus then said. Women, woman, which is a term of affection by the way, it's a, it's a very kindly term. Um, at times he, he referred to his, his mother by that term. Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? The word accuser here means complainant. Normally that would be a spouse. It's unusual here that these religious officials are, are, are bringing this accusation against this woman. It refers to one filing charges, which had to be the primary witness against the woman. And theoretically, if the, if the death penalty was being enforced, they would be the first to cast a stone. And that's what Jesus refers to. 
The men who insisted she was guilty refused, one after another, to stand up as the official complainant against the woman. It's possible the woman was a known sinner who was set up by these men. By the way, it's, there's no inclination in the Bible that this was Mary Magdalene. That's just something that came about years later uh, that's very unfair to Mary Magdalene. One of these men accusing her may have been her adulterous partner, we don't know. But they were all convicted of sin. So none of them would say, I'm willing to, for, to um, uh, file a formal charge against this woman and, and be her primary accuser. They just wanted this woman as a, as a theoretical case of adultery. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to stand up as, as a formal complainant because they all knew that someone else knew that they were an adulterer. They only wanted to accuse Jesus of being anti-law. And so they didn't, they didn't want this to get personal about them. Then Jesus faced this woman after her, after her accusers had all left and had refused to press charges against her. And he said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Okay. Did Jesus imply adultery was no longer a sin by saying, I don't condemn you? Remember, this was not a trial. This was a confrontation that was intended as a means of making Jesus look like a hypocrite, someone who preached God's law but wouldn't actually apply it. The forgiveness here implied was not a civil forgiveness because this was not a civil trial. This had nothing to do with the penalty against adultery and what it should be. If her husband had accused this woman of adultery, she could still be brought up on charges. And there was no death penalty there. She could still be divorced <clears throat> for adultery. Jesus only disqualified those scribes and Pharisees who didn't really want to stand up as her accuser. The forgiveness he gave was religious. Note the scribes and Pharisees only called him master, teacher. As a, a sign of uh, professional and academic courtesy. The woman called him Lord. She acknowledged that he was far more than they would acknowledge. Jesus meant, I'm not going to press charges against you. That's what he meant by, neither do I accuse thee. I'm not a complainant against thee. I'm not a witness against thee. Jesus was not her accuser is what this means. Elsewhere, Jesus was presented with a, a legal case when some siblings were arguing about an inheritance. And he said, that's not my job. I'm not going to be a judge in a civil court against your affairs. So no witness remained against this woman. Jesus was not a witness against her. And so he said, I am not your accuser. I won't stand in that capacity, but go and don't sin anymore. He still admitted adultery was a sin. <coughs> but he said, I'm not your official accuser either. Apparently you don't have any left. Jesus <coughs> did not depreciate adultery, <coughs> but it required an official accusation, and no accuser remained. Jesus told her to sin no more. Now, guilty people can often act very self-righteous. Some of those men who have been outed in recent days once championed women's rights. And they decried sexual harassment while engaged in it. In the case of the woman taken in adultery, it was the authority of Jesus that convinced and convicted these men of their own sin. I don't think these men were just feeling guilty about their adultery. When Jesus spoke, he con made sure they were convicted of, of sin. It was, I think, the power of Jesus' word making them skulk out of the uh, scene. <clears throat> 
And I think the same power that Jesus used to convict them was conveyed when Jesus told the woman, sin no more. He commanded her to live a changed life. He commanded her to live by a changed ethic. And this particularly refers to the sin of adultery. He says, you're not going to do this anymore. I think there was some authority behind that, not just advice. So people would, would reject this view. And they, they said, well, this is improbable that the high, these uh, religious leaders were actually guilty of adultery because they had a high moral ethic. They claimed to have a high moral ethic. But remember, they were plotting to destroy Jesus. And six, within six months, they were responsible for getting him executed. Their ethics are those of murderers. Jesus had already called them hypocrites. And Jesus would elsewhere call that whole generation adulterous. So it was obviously common. Jesus offered this woman religious forgiveness. Civil forgiveness was really not in view. She was still liable to prosecution. A wrong view of this passage has repercussions. Periodically we hear of someone in prison, sometimes on death row, who want their sentences commuted, or pardoned even, or parole because they're now a changed person. Sometimes they become Christians. And I know at least one member of the Manson family said she was a born-again Christian. Uh, from, and that she became a Christian during her time in prison. And she wanted out. She wanted to do some good in the world. B bad theology. You know, that, that idea that I'm forgiven, I should have a second chance in life. It didn't work for the thief on the cross, certainly. But that's not what Jesus said in any way. Jesus in no way lessened God's law or its application. Jesus religiously forgave her, but he wasn't in a civil trial, so this was not even a case where he was speaking as to the civ proper civil punishment of it, even in theory. He, his forgiveness was religious. So we can have a religious forgiveness with, and yet still be liable for the criminal or civil penalties. Jesus in no way lessened God's law. The scribes and Pharisees were defeated, not victorious. One of the reasons adultery was so common then is that it wasn't being punished. The death penalty is a deterrent. It always has been a deterrent. If you don't want the death penalty, it's a deterrent. It's, it's as simple as that. We have the same problem today. Adultery is common because they're it's viewed as less serious, and the consequences of adultery are less. The church compounds this problem by saying, just forgive adultery like Jesus did. What happens when the church says adultery must be forgiven is they're telling the innocent party that you can't get justice. God doesn't allow you to have justice. And that your partner can break the marriage covenant, but there are no consequences for it. Why do you have a covenant and enter into a covenant that cannot be broken? Why do we have vows for marriage if it isn't possible to actually break those vows and break the covenant? Very often, the innocent party is told, he says he's sorry, you have to forgive him. And if you don't forgive him, you're the sinner and you'll be under church discipline. It happens a lot. They're often called vindictive if they want a divorce. Unforgiving, unchristian, because the church has an improper view of what religious forgiveness. A person can be religiously forgiven but still be liable to the civil penalties. The church then makes the marriage covenant meaningless because they have, there's no consequences involved if you break it. 
Under biblical law, the innocent party was freed from the marriage by the death of the guilty party. Death by divorce. The same approach has been made following other offenses, such as fraud, theft, or rape, and other crimes. He's repentant. Forgive him. Don't take it to the police. That's your Christian duty, just to forgive. They confuse Religious forgiveness with civil forgiveness. Not even for God forgives without the punishment being paid. God didn't look at Jesus who lived a perfect life for over 30 years and saying, good job, I'll forgive the world. The penalty of death had to be paid. And Jesus, though innocent, because he took our sins on him, had to suffer our death penalty. The penalty still had to be paid. That's why it's called atonement. It's a covering. It was a requirement. You see, what happens when we remove God's justice is that all that remains then is injustice. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand the magnitude of our forgiveness and the magnitude of, of of, of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. But help us to also understand what you require of us as Christians, the faithfulness that you require because of our faith in Jesus. Help us not to lessen our responsibility to obey you, but help us to take our responsibility to obey you and to live by your law more seriously because we believe in, in Jesus. Help, as Paul said, that our faith to establish the law in us and to give us a better understanding of your holiness and your righteousness. We pray by the power of your spirit, you would, you would sanctify us, make us more holy, make us more submissive to you and to your law word. And we pray that you we would, um, in some small way, be able to further your kingdom this day and this week in our efforts to serve you. In our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is 3-3.